Hello. <laughs> As you can see, we are here at the Winelands Light Railway. Uh, it's not far out of Stellenbosch, very close to the N1. And we have decided to come to this place because we heard that it's got scale model steam engines, as you can hear. And uh, we are crazy about these old steam trains, so we thought we better come and have a look because we heard that the owner says that it was a passion of his that got out of control. So <laughs> <laughs> that went too far, oh, yes. Oh. And um, for me, I heard that his first one was a third scale model of the train, yes. the, the steam engine that connected uh, Baira to Umtali. Wow. That has special significance to me yes. because my parents honeymooned in Baira and um, my oldest brother was born in Umtali, Shows which is you. Mutare today. Yes, yes, yes. So we're going to pack up and go. We've got beautiful parking over here. You can have a look. All the cars are under the shade. Beautiful area. Yes. So we're going to pack our things, our picnic that we brought for the day and go and explore the place and see what it looks like. How many hectares did they say? It was like seven and a half or something I like that. I can't remember now. Oh, quite a big area. So let's go and check it out. So we've just paid, it's 70 yes. Rand for third class, which I am today, oh. for a single uh, ride and entry, and you first class, so unlimited, unlimited rides, rides. So and entry. 190 total. Eh? For the yeah. two of us. Yes. And um, we just learned that the owner, Andres, um, built his first um, replica steam engine when he was 19, and he named her Doreen, after his mother, Doreen. And yes, Doreen. Yes, Doreen. <laughs> In all her glory. We're so happy to be yeah, here today. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to have you here. Today. Thanks, Doreen. Thank you. All right. Beautiful, yeah. Oh, look here. They've got animals there. Is that a bourbon? It's like goats and things. Beware animals bite. This is a beautiful place, eh? Oh, there are goats. There's one too. Yes. We'll check them out when they come out. And then lots of, is it copper sculptures? Kudu? No, it's steel. Oh, is it steel? Yeah. Giraffe. Sure. And lots and lots of fever trees. I love the fever trees, eh? Even your goats have got shade, you see? Yeah, I love that. I'm just <laughs> checking it out. <laughs> it's turned out to be a beautiful day. This is a big place, yeah. so there will be a lot of walking today, which uh, you will do alone for the most part. But look how beautiful this canopy is here, under the trees. Yeah, it is gorgeous. Look how families, can you imagine children? Yeah. Perfect place for them and for, Don't do that. for families. I There's even a tunnel the train goes through there. I'm not going to film it now, but I can see them going through the tunnel. And what about the little bridge? And there's a bridge and everything, and a metal bridge too. And a crocodile a of grass. Crocodile. You're going to get your exercise in today. But it's so nice here. It's wonderful. This is where we're going to sit to have a bit of a lunch. Right next to the railway station and tracks. <laughs> As usual, we always have to eat something wherever we go. So on our way here, we stopped in Somerset West and bought ourselves two small pizzas. One barbecue chicken and pineapple, which Sonia loves. Yes. And a tangy Russian, which I love. And Coke Zero. And there's no alcohol allowed yet, so I am going to be enjoying Coke Zero as well. <laughs> yes, and uh, this is the extent of our picnic today. That's it. Platform one, platform two. Okay, everybody ready? Yes. 
Lady Anne. It's a rail crossing, so one has to be careful. Okay. If you check, this is a serious narrow gauge line because this is a liter Coke bottle. <laughs> How cool is this? Okay, everybody ready? Let's go one, all aboard! This is so cool. That it's a genuine steam train, but a miniature one. Thank you. 
This is so enjoyable. So many people come here with their children. I think the dads are enjoying it more than what the kids are. <laughs> because I'm enjoying it. Big crocodile that. That's the station. See all the passengers waiting for the train to arrive. There's a looks like a diesel one on platform two. I want to try and get onto that one. That's the antelope, kudus, sable. I don't know what this one is, maybe an impala, giraffe. More people coming in. I am seriously impressed. I am going to be speaking to the mastermind behind all of this, Andres. So this one looks like a diesel, but it's actually electric. And Andres bought this as well. It's his fourth one that he bought. Yeah, number four of 2016. Crazy. And the charge lasts about two days. So this is Andres in his workshop. And uh, he's going to explain to us now why he started this whole setup here. Because if you were with me on the one ride now, and it's like incredible. So Andres, why did you start this? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Can't remember. It's so long ago. So, I mean, I'm 37 this year. I've been doing this since I was 13. Wow. And... Um, the thing is, these are skills that, that's not taught at university or any sort of college. I don't think, I've never really seen anybody that's come from establishments like that that do this sort of stuff. This yes. is home built. Uh, I mean, the guys that built these things back in the day, they taught me. Um, and they taught all of the guys that are involved here, basically. So we've, we've grown up through the ranks, learning from these guys. And uh, they are disappearing at an alarming rate. Oh, crazy. Eh? So, unfortunately, we've lost a lot of friends over the past few years, uh, particularly since COVID. And um, the, the skills are disappearing. So, it's a very stressful place to be. So, why did I start it? I mean, I was obsessed with trains from a young age. Your and mother told us as we came <laughs> in. <laughs> and um, when I joined the model engineers, yes. I joined it purely because I wanted to play toy trains. I mean, there's no way a youngster can go and drive big exactly. trains. Exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's almost accessible. It's small enough to get into. But the guys involved in this thing, first of all, all English, and I'm just a Dutchman. <laughs> so I had to learn to speak English very quickly at the age of 13. And um, I had to butter up the old guys and, and get them to allow me to just 
touch their stuff because all I wanted to do was just just see it, play yeah. with it. Anyways, uh, you know, eventually they, they I gained their trust and they let me loose on their steam engines. So, uh, but within a few years of driving trains, you quickly become bored of it. Okay. And then you get into building it because this is actually the fun part of it. Building the trains. Building it, making all these bits and pieces. When you when you drive it. I mean, it's good fun, but we go around and around in circles uh, all the time. It's, it does become quite boring eventually. But you can actually make this stuff. Uh, and once you realize that you can make anything, um, you know, the sky is the limit. You can build anything you want. Anything you see, you can make. What I found interesting was the first one that you built was a replica of the one that used to travel from uh, Mtali to Byra. Byra. That's yes, right. Yes, so yes. how I started with that, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big yet small locomotive it's 1895 model wow design so 1895 you must understand this is a this is a 1906 1904 model it's 10 years later okay they became very big very quickly but these things didn't last very long because they were actually too small for what the railways needed so they were scrapped within like oh. five to ten years oh, wow. so doreen is based on a lawley slight modifications um and that was Cecil John Rhodes' train that ran between Byra and, and okay. Tali. It was the only access the British had into Rhodesia, because of course the Dutchman cut them off in the Transvaal. <laughs> Everything went via the two-foot narrow gauge on the, the Byra line. Wow. 222 miles of narrow gauge track through the bush, barely any stonework. It was laid in a hell of a rush, and within five years the track was considered to be too light for the traffic, and it was all scrapped. Oh, no. So these engines, 44 of them, ended up across Southern Africa at sugar mills. Uh, some of them ended up at Zebedeela Estate in uh, the northern province. Zebedeela, at the turn of the century, was such a big operation, you can pro provide every eighth person on earth with an orange. What? It was massive. So these little engines were pulling out oranges out so of the field. So you saying the narrow gauge is similar to the Apple Express one? Yes, two foot gauge, yes. 24 inch gauge. Okay, yes, yes. Uh, it is a very inferior gauge as far as, uh, well, today's standards are considered. Yes. Uh, it was, was built to compete with an ox wagon. Oh boy. It's a very light way yeah. of, of, of moving freight, uh, or cheap way of doing it, particularly if you've got mountainous terrains. Yes. Of course, it can go around bends very easily, and it, it's, it's far cheaper than Cape Gauge okay. to build. Uh, South Africa. <clears throat> We obviously have uh, Cape Gauge, which is uh, three foot six. That's our standard. And then in Europe, we've got four foot eight and a half, wow. which is internationally known as standard gauge. Okay. So even our broad gauge is considered narrow gauge, narrow gauge internationally. Yes. Wow. And we are stuck with it, and that's why our trains don't really work, because they are actually too small to compete on an international scale. Um. We had the ability back in the day to move massive amounts of, of traffic on it, even on this so-called inferior gauge but if you really want to keep with the times you need broad gauge okay, okay. so this is narrow gauge it is it's basically a um, steam powered ox wagon at the end of the day it's, it's <laughs> it is sophisticated but it's not that sophisticated there's obviously lots of components in this yes uh, diesel locomotive on the other hand you stick a key in it and it goes this thing the entire engine is outside everything that makes a steam engine go forward also wants to kill it <laughs> so okay. the ash for example that comes out of the firebox if mixed with water becomes acidic uh, and it just eats through metal oh, so, so these engines standing outside stations you'll see these holes rusted straight through them yes because there's ash in there oh. and from standing outside for years you'll see that it, 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 it just straight straight through the metal yes so that's why they require an enormous amount of energy to keep keep going and you'll see that's why they all got female names <laughs> They're incredibly difficult some days, but they're extremely pretty to look at. So um, exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, we've kept with the tradition. Bonnie, of course, is built by um, Charles Fillion from Pretoria, absolute master steam engine builder. Taught us a lot. Oh wow! And uh, Bonnie is obviously his partner. Uh, his dad's engine, which is running today, Uncle Sarl is no longer with us, but that's named after his mom, Lady Anne. Lady Anne. Okay. And um, they built the two engines together at the same time. This one is obviously in the shop now for a little bit of maintenance. And this was you stripped down completely. There's the boiler lying over there. That's getting a new set of tubes, which I'll show you just now. All of the, the mechanical movement here has been um, tightened up and new bins, pins and bushes made up. So she'll be good to go for another few years. This engine was completed in 2001, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, since coming here, she's done quite a lot of work. So it is overdue. There's the cab standing. It's got a brand new coat of varnish on it. It's looking all smart. 
all the brass fittings is being uh, remachined and made, made tight, steam tight, so um, it should last for a good few years. This is one of the best engines in the fleet here. Okay. Really does a lot of work. Uh, very efficient. <laughs> if I say efficient, steam engines aren't efficient. Coal burning locomotives on this scale, correct me if I'm wrong here, the science is out there, but as far as we know, it's about 3% efficient. Oh, wow. But you can burn anything. As long as, well, we burn coal. It's, it, yes. it's just better for the boilers. Uh, they can burn wood, but it doesn't last that long. The calorific value of wood is obviously okay. much lower than steam. Yes. Uh, so we burn coal when we can find it. Oh, you struggle to find? Oh, yeah. Because since COVID, just, just, just out of interest, <laughs> yeah. since COVID, coal has gone up from a thousand rand a ton. We're now paying four and a half thousand rand a ton. What? So the cost of running these things, are, it's absolutely getting out of hand. Wow. It is very worrying, uh, material-wise as well, very expensive to, to replace bushes and that sort of stuff. So, you know, people come to these kind of operations and they see, ooh, steam trains and cars in the parking mm -hmm. lot. Oh, this guy's making a killing, I'm yeah, going to do the same. Yeah. <laughs> you need all of this stuff just to keep these things alive. Going, you, need, yeah. you need a crew of people continuously working on them. Uh, it's, it's, we do it because we love it. Yeah, it's a passion. Uh, it, it, yeah. it's, no, it's not a passion. It is a, it's a mental disorder. <laughs> a normal person would look at this and go, what is wrong with you people? Oh, but boy. there's just something about a steam engine. It's, you know, as it stands, it's a big dead lump of metal. But when you make a fire in it, it, it comes alive. It, it actually breathes. Yeah. Uh, when you, you you have to work with it very carefully because it will bite you. It's it's it's, it's a living, <laughs> it's a mechanical horse at the end of the day. True, eh? so, that's what they um, called them back it, in the it day. It is, it is. Yeah. It's a, an interesting thing is, I mean, when these things first came out, when Stevenson's rocket was about doing about forty six kilometers an hour, human beings had never gone that fast. So it it was preached against that these things are from the devil. Oh, and a no. man traveling at that sort of speed, the skin would peel off his face. <laughs> Pregnant woman will abort and oh, horses will no. die of fright. <laughs> so, um, I mean, we've come a hell of a long way. If you think about it, uh, the, the world speed record for a steam engine was set in the 1940s. I'm just get my dates right here. It still stands to this day, a locomotive by the name of uh, Mallard. Um, 126, 127 miles an hour. For a, steam for a steam engine. That's, That's crazy. I must get it right. There's two speed records. One is for a steam car. I think that's 127 miles an hour. 1906. Two years no. before the Model T was invented. And the steam locomotive, of course, I think it's 124. Uh, that stands to this day. So there's two steam locomotives on this planet with a world record. Incredible. That one in the York Railway Museum. Yes. And Doreen standing down at the yard also holds a Guinness World Record. Really? For the longest distance traveled in 24 hours. We achieved wow. uh, 330 kilometers going round and round in circles. Your train that you built, My Doreen. actual engine standing down there. So that's, that's what it's sort of known for. That's an incredible it's, it's achievement. A, it, eh? it, we beat the, the British by 60 K, so they're slightly annoyed with me, but it's fine. We have a, a hate-love hate relationship, <laughs> so hopefully, yes. One day they'll beat us again, and then we'll take it on, take it on again, and beat yeah. them again. <laughs> because this railway is built long and straight exactly for that reason. When oh, we did the record okay. back in Peter Maritzburg, we used the track that we had. Okay. And uh, it was 336 meters. Uh, this is 760 meters long piece of railway line. Oh, it's long, eh? But the straights are long and straight, okay. so you can really floor it. Okay. You can't really go around corners fast with these things. No. So you can't lean to the corner like no. a motorbike. So they want to fall over. So to maintain your speed, you need to bank the curves. All right. uh, but here we've got the long straight so we can really floor it. Oh, okay. We travel here at about 8 k's an hour on average, 8 to 10 kilometers an hour. Fast walking pace. Yes. It's a safe pace for, for rail operation. Uh, the, uh, the top speed I think we reached there was about 35 kilometers an hour. Wow. So, and it can go faster, but it's terrifying. With Doreen? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. It's absolutely terrifying. That is amazing, eh? Okay, so... Here we have the lathe, uh, and this job that we're busy with here is the boiler tubes for the uh, boiler we're busy restoring at the back there. Okay. 
And what we've done now, I'm not going to cut anything because yes. it's already just been cut to size. We're yes. going to turn that. As you can see, the job turns, uh, well, it's basically held in the truck and the cutting tool stands still. Okay, yes. So we will move the tool into there and it will start, start cutting, cutting oh, okay. with this, this lever over here. Okay. Okay. Uh, various different types of tools, obviously, do all sorts of different things. This is a boring bar. This goes inside a pipe, for example, or something that you want to make hollow. That's a the boring head there. Uh, then we've got a parting tool here that splits, it, splits the job off. Okay. It's a short little flat one. Uh, and then there's tools for cutting threads and all sorts of various... These are all tip tools. Now, that little part there is replaceable. But uh, you can also grind your own tools. So you occasionally oh, wow. make tools if you've got special sort of round things that we need to make. That is the basics of a lathe. The uh, important thing to know with this is the smaller the job, the faster it has to turn. Okay. Because of the peripheral speed. All oh, right. So um, a component that size, we can really speed it up here. That's the speeds over there. Just run it here. Oh, wow. Look at that. A little bit faster. Uh, but the bigger the diameter, the slower the job has to turn oh, because okay. the peripheral speed is much higher. Oh, right. uh, and what happens is the tool starts burning. It gets hot. And it gets hot. So we've got coolant that we run on it. Yeah. Um, but that's why the bigger the locomotive, the longer it takes because there's oh. so much more metal to work. The smaller it is, the quicker you can make it. But then again, the detail work becomes very tricky, I which I'll show you that. now. <laughs> so that's the lathe over there. We've got a milling machine. We can walk over here. This is a machine for making square things. Got a cutter in there at the moment, it is switched off. Um, and then over there is a very old mill, but it is a CNC operated machine. So it looks quite antiquated, 1980s model this, but it's German made and it's extremely strong. Okay, so, uh, good quality, so it's a good quality yeah. machine. And um, these things are being kicked out of machine shops all over the country because they're too slow. Okay. So if you're running a production facility, it's not worth having a machine like this. You want something that it's 10 times faster cutting wise because time is money yes and we have no electricity so <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> the gaps when you have electricity you've got to make parts as quickly as you can yes, so that's yes. that's the basics of it we obviously put the job in there cutters go in there you can do the programming over there and it will do the job for do you do what you tell it to if do. you well, you better know what you're telling it because <laughs> if you don't it crashes the job oh serious makes quite a mess i can imagine okay so we go over that side excuse the mess here it I is like an active workshop you have to have that for this <laughs> environment because outside everything is hot. Yep. This is a model maker's workshop. That's a more industrial machine shop. Okay. Um, so the lathe we just looked at here is a baby version of it. This is a Myford lathe. Oh, wow. Here we go. It is imperial. And that means every time you work on it, you must remember that four oh, thou that is 0.1 is millimeters. Oh, and boy. you've got to continuously think about it. There's a parting tool at the back here. And then you can see some of the smaller homemade tools that, that we grind. Yes, yes. Uh, there's a drill in the chuck there, so people say, oh, but the, this isn't turning. You don't have to, the drill stands still, the job is turning. The job's turning, yes. So, just out of interest, this is a, a wooden pattern for a locomotive wheel. All right. It's obviously too big to go in there, it'll go in the big lathe. But this is how wheels were made in the old days. You would have made up a pattern out of wood. If you look closely, this is all individual pieces okay. that the guy had made. This is for a South African Railway 16 E-class locomotive. The original engine, this was six foot in diameter. Imagine a pattern this size, I mean, taller than what I am. Um, well, not taller than what I am. No. About as tall as I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it, but I mean, in England, they had locomotives with much bigger wheels, seven and eight feet. It's incredible. Built for speed. Yeah. Uh, this would be stamped into the sand, and then you cast metal into it. Oh, okay. So that's a solid cast. Well, this is a wooden yeah. pattern, and then yeah. it's a cast steel wheel. Yeah. But you yeah. must also remember, when you're casting metal, it's, it's at a certain temperature, obviously molten, uh, so it's much bigger than the final mm. product. So this is a certain percentage bigger. When it cools down, it shrinks, and then you stick oh, it back in the I lathe, see. and then you turn it to size. So the walls are always much thicker than what you need it. This is the counterbalance, and the reason for this on the big ones, these would have been packed with lead. Uh, it's to counterbalance the reciprocal motion okay, of the mechanical okay. arms on the side. And this, and this, these things could do 120, 140 k's an hour. What? So your balancing had to be perfect. If it wasn't, it would shake itself to pieces. I can imagine. So it's like the wheel balancing on a car. Eh? Exactly the same thing. Yes. This is a shaping machine. We'll just set that going. 
uh, I think the globe has just blown <laughs> in an earlier demonstration. <laughs> in Afrikaans, it's called a sterk arm scarf machine. Sterk arm, okay. I've never <laughs> heard the word before. The other day I had a gentleman through here and he said to us, that's what it's called. So I've learned something. That's brilliant. Uh, yeah. this, this is obviously shaping the, the block. There's a cutting tool in there. I can see that. And yeah. it's not cutting at the moment because I haven't set it to yeah. go. But it will cut and when it returns, this little block lifts okay. Lifts and it doesn't burn the tool. So let's set it going and then we set it there Look and away that. it goes. Very slow. Also very antiquated machine. I've never seen anything this size. Normally these things are quite large. But this was made redundant by the milling machine. Okay. So we just like it because it, it looks like a steam engine. <laughs> <laughs> and it works yeah, the internals, yeah. it's got arms that, that work oh, like okay. a steam locomotive. But I suppose you can do small finishing. We still do. I okay. made quite a few parts on this so far. Okay. It's just slow. You just let it go in the background. It does uh, its thing. And it, it does its thing. Yeah. It's almost through there. And then when you get to the other side, you will reset it, set the tool slightly lower, and it will, and it will work its way okay. back. There it's finishing the job now. So we just run it off the job. Done. And we switch it off. Fantastic. So, I mean, that was quick, but that's a pretty tiny little component Stack there. And the nice on. thing about it is it's perfectly straight. Yeah. Because this, this works, in a, as long as this thing is not worn out and it's working upwards, yes, yes. it will give you a straight action movement. This is a horizontal mill. Oh, good, the light works. Uh, similar sort of concept as a milling machine, except the, the machine surface is in this, this okay. orientation. Cutting keyways on this, very handy. Uh, you can do all sorts of fun stuff on it. You can also stack these these discs together to get a greater surface okay, area. But again, the limitations of this is you can't take too much of a heavy cut because it's a very really light machine. Yeah. The heavier the machine is, the more robust, bigger the bigger the you cuts can you can, yeah. can do with it. Um, yeah, and then we have simple things, I mean, right down to this sort drill of thing. Press. This is a drill press. Yes. Uh, we haven't wired this one in yet because it is, it's actually three-phase. <laughs> okay. Uh, we've just put the plug in there. But this is an old German-made thing. It still says Achtung on the front here. Wow. When I first got it from this, this particular collection of machines, I couldn't open this damn top until I realized... <laughs> have you ever heard a sound like it's that? Like, look at that. I mean, it's just wow. so well made. And it's extremely and you can, accurate. You can set the different speeds of the belt. Yeah, that so that, that, that's so yes. again, just like the lathe. The yeah. bigger the diameter of the drill, yes. the slower the, the job goes. Okay. Uh, so that's how you adjust <laughs> that. Now this workshop comes out of a guy's collection called Ron Etter oh, um, wow. from Neisner. And Ron was a prolific locomotive builder okay. in this country. Uh, he passed away at the age of 92 and the family contacted me so we bought up the, uh, the machine shop. But Ron designed many engines like the one in the background here. Yeah. Uh, won prizes for it all over the place. Um, incredible works of art. And he's also gone. So, you know, there's more information lost there. What's nice about Ron's stuff is he documented almost anything, anything and everything that he made. So we've oh, got stacks fantastic. of drawings and, and notes of making components. Uh, so we can still use it to this day. Um, a lot of the stuff we, we make here, we still use as formulas. Very handy stuff. That shows you what the older guys did. But I mean, you look at a workshop and you think, you know, you need a lathe. But you know, then you need all the dyes that go with it. <laughs> nice and dusty here. There's, there's dyes here to cut. It's cutting a thread like that. Eh? I will show you where this is used just now. <laughs> but, you know, this is like dental delicacy. Definitely. Eh, heart, heart surgery stuff. I'll show you this. This belongs to this locomotive. Let's take a walk there and I'll show you. This engine is made, was originally started by a guy called Johnny Sharp from Focheville. Uh, it was then taken over by Patrick Ackerman, who built this magnificent tender for it. Everything here works. If you look at the suspension, it's a bit dusty now, but all the compensating okay. gear, yeah. this is called a Buckeye bogey. It's a very complicated thing to manufacture. But all the little parts work just like the real thing. That's this is one twelfth scale. Let me put some compressed air on it and you can see it working. Okay, so after many years, you get to this stage, you quickly put a piece of pipe onto it, you set your valve timing, and when you turn the compressor on, it comes to life. Oh, wow. It's the most amazing feeling in the world. I can imagine. It's, eh? This is the closest any human will ever have to having godly powers you breathe life yeah. into a dead machine that's forwards and that's backwards you can see how all the timing that little link is slightly loose there yes. 
but there you can see exactly the movement. This to me is poetry in motion. It's, now quiet. it's mechanical art. Oh, this is brilliant. Eh? So this is many years worth of toil to get this far. Eh? It's not finished yet. It's strong enough. This should be able to pull about 10 people. This one? Yeah, uh, on a level piece of track, wow. easily. But we don't run these things really here because this is a commercial operation. Okay. And um, we need to run the big engines, obviously, to keep everything alive. But ultimately, we will have a track where we can play with this sort of stuff. But this, this you do totally out of the love of it. Uh, it is obviously worth a lot at the end of the day. But it's worth more to us because, you know, the, the guys that do this sort of stuff did this because they, they, they enjoyed it, it like, yes. like we enjoy it. Exactly. So this, I'll bring this component out here. This guy, Uncle Nick, who's unfortunately no longer with us. Uh, him and Ron Etter, for example, master model makers. This is the, the knuckle coupler. This is the mechanical oh, okay, hands that hold yes. a train together. This is the, the coupler for you. For the front, now, Patrick yeah. didn't make this. Uncle Nick made this. And he gave it to him as a present shortly before his death. But it works just like the real thing. The real you put thing, them together, eh? and it won't that's go how anywhere. a train holds hands. It, it, it's incredibly strong. So that's the couplers for you. Uncle Nick made and similar. And he made this? He machined this himself? He made that from solid. Nick made many engines. That's incredible. I mean, the, the Poppich family, everything they do is just better than everything we, anything we can do. I hate them. I see the <laughs> box here. To Patrick, yes. Uncle, oh, Uncle Nick. Nick. Oh, wow. So it's, it's pretty damn special. But I we're lucky. You know, traditionally, I, I say traditionally, but there's very few examples of a father doing this and his son being interested in it. Yes, Many yes. of the engines we got is because the kids aren't interested. Uh, okay. uh, I mean, I wasn't interested in what my dad did either, so <laughs> okay. you can hear me talking. But <laughs> it freaks me out that these sort of things are sitting in garages somewhere disappearing or being sold overseas because they have yes. no worth in this country. Oh, no. They're only worth something overseas. That's why. If you took the hours to produce this and you had to monetize it, it's, it's actually, you know, uncostable. Yeah, you can't, yeah. And if you, you look can't at, put a monetary value on it. If you look it. at this, this is something Uncle Nick also made. But as I say, in, in the Poppich's case, Nick's son Rocco and his grandson are still continuing the hobby. Okay. And, and they are master engineers. Okay. Everything. Okay. This detail. I don't know how well you can see this, but there's actual writing on there. What? You'll be able to see my fingerprint. <laughs> That's incredible. This pumps water. No. It's not a dummy. There's a little valve in there. Everything has a seat on. I, I mean, you know, Uncle Nick was an old man when he made this. I mean, he was an old man when I met him. They've all, all the guys were all always old. <laughs> but what I'm thinking now is... And they had, they had the stability in their hands to do this sort of stuff. What patience don't you have to make something like this? Well, you say that, but at the same time... Some of these model makers can be cantankerous old buggers <laughs> because all they want to do is to be left alone to go and manufacture okay. these sort of things in yes. their garages. And as kids, when we, we rocked up at the model engineers and we talked, you know, you try and sort of butter these guys up, they were terrifying. Oh, really? <laughs> because, you know, I mean, if you have the ability to do this sort of stuff, surely oh. you must be a difficult old bugger. You must bugger. be, yeah. <laughs> but they're actually such nice people. and. Once you befriend them, they won't shut up. And they want to share their experience. They, they actually want to share yeah. it. So, yeah. But, I mean, those little bolts there, yes. 1.2 millimeter diameter oh. shank, that's made. That's not bought. And that's the threads that you showed that you cut through those dies? Some of them is cut with a die. Some of them are machined on the lathe. So, uh, it's just, you know, I, oh, I, I'm in yeah. absolute awe of this sort of no, thing. I don't blame so you. So, that, that goes down there, and that will pump the water into the boiler. Okay. Up there. That's the overflow pipe. And it works just like the real thing. Perfect. Eh? Incredible. Andres, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you spending all this time with me. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure we're going to have so many comments and re uh, responses to this video of ours. We've started doing workshop tours here on weekends now. Okay. Uh, it's very popular. Yeah, it's actually yeah. a big pain in the backside because you've got no work done. <laughs> <laughs> but people yeah. standing around here talking trains all day. But at least people can experience it. Now tell me, uh, do you thing. do this full time or is this a part time? This is my job. Is this your full time it's job? It's ruined my hobby. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do this to get away from the world. Okay, okay. You know, you'd spend evenings in your workshop tinkering away, making stuff. Um, mm. 
And now the world is in our backyard every weekend. But then again, you don't go to work now. You go and do your... Well, I go to work. I walk out of my house half dirty. And I don't <laughs> have to drive anywhere. It's just fantastic. Oh, uh, yeah. We do this here. We've got a few other rail projects across the country. Okay. Um, but yeah, I've unfortunately made this a career. I'm the only person really doing this on a commercial basis. Basis, okay. The rest of the guys are still doing it as a hobby. But we have to do it as a commercial operation because... There is no funding available to preserve this stuff. I understand that. Yeah. So unless yeah. you are a Rupert or a, a you know a Kurs Becker or a yes, somebody yes. with the financial backing to do this, it's not going to survive. Yeah, yeah. And another thing I want to mention is, is that you built the tram at Century City. Yes, eh? there's the spare wheels for it down there. We built it in this workshop down there. Uh, <laughs> the red ones? The red ones. Okay. So um, that's a spare set. We always keep a spare set handy. I say you, uh, that, that your mother told us that you built that there at the. Uh, we Century built that set. here. In this workshop? There wasn't a workshop. This is all new. We've just, <laughs> we've just closed it off, but we okay. built it here. I say, I always say my workshop started under a tree <laughs> <laughs> because it started in a, a cattle feed shed. Wow. Then I moved, I got married and it moved into a little garage. Then, I, then it got busy and I moved into a four a house with four garages because there was a lot of space for all the stuff yes. and then we moved to Cape Town or Stellenbosch and we packed it all into a container and I worked out of a container for about four years in wow. this heat. In this, I can imagine. So you know people come here and they see this stuff and think oh this must be a millionaire's place. Exactly. It's not. It's made from scratch by all one those engine, two hands. those <laughs> dirty hands and worn out shoes. <laughs> One engine became two, two became yeah. four, and today we look after other people's machines because there is no other place to send it. And they're all too happy to send them to you? Because at, least, at least it lives. The story, is, the story is must continued. get told. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's what we like doing. Andres, thank you so much. <laughs> Great pleasure. <laughs> this place is beautiful, but you need to be a, a good strong walker because there's a lot of walking here. Unfortunately, I don't fall into that category, but I have a passenger who just boarded a train and who I am waiting at the train tracks to come by. So let me see if I can spot him and give him a wave. My passenger is not on this one. I believe this is a little diesel one. But I hear the whistle of the steam one in the distance. I think it just crossed the bridge there. This is the perfect place for children. We saw birthday parties. It's emptied out a little. It looks like this is a quite a nice time to come. When it's quieter, there's no waiting time for the trains. Um, it's absolutely amazing the passion these guys have for their, what is it, craft. There he's coming! So authentic, it's super cool. I hope we never grow up. We've gone through the tunnel, which I did not see, and there I see the little cap. The biggest grin ever.
So this one was also built by Andres, number five. Yeah, he does such neat work, eh? Yes, Doreen, the first locomotive that Andres built, 2012, number one, 2012. And this is the one that holds the the record. On the 10th of December this locomotive completed a journey of 330 kilometers in 24 hours setting a new world record. That's mind-blowing! So this is Anna UVE number, number 2 built by H. Paling in 1989. Look at this, this work is phenomenal. DHR oh. 
Sarl and Sons, built 1997's Pretoria SA Loco number no. 7 Locomotive Works. Look at this. This is so well done. I must say, these things blow my mind. The coffee shop with some interesting items inside you. You just smell the coffee. Audi. This looks like a pedal bike. Love these old tractors. Yeah.
And this is our train driver. <laughs> There's so much fun and games for the kids here. So much space for them to play and enjoy themselves. Little wheelbarrows. They even play yukska here. Two pitches, courts. Yeah. What are they called? Pitches, I think. Good heavens. That's cool. This is a very cool place. Oh, I love it here. I love it here. So I saw a few birthday parties and I never saw the sign here that says reserved for a birthday crossing. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite nice. Yeah. People have lots of fun here, especially sure. the little ones. Yes. How's this giraffe as well? Yo! It's a massive rhino as well. Prehistoric rhino this, that's for sure. Look how it's coming through the fever trees. Yes. How awesome is this? Fritz. This is Fritz. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Oh. We are ending right where we started today. <laughs> wow, what a fantastic day. Oh. But I am unfortunately not fit enough to enjoy it. Thoroughly. I know. I had to do a lot of sitting around waiting for you. But for people who can walk, this is the place. People with young children, yeah, grandchildren, absolutely. this is the place to go. Absolutely. This is the place to go. Yeah, Seriously. whether for the young and the young at heart, I mean, it is just fantastic. Yeah, I agree. All round, I mean, bring your picnic. It became a little windy this afternoon. It did, it did. But um, it, it's just a, a, a great, great family outing, I think. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I enjoyed speaking to Andres. The man loves what he does. Yeah. He's, really, he's, a, he's a typical example of someone who has turned his passion into something full-time. But it's a big job that he's tackled, yeah. It's a hard job. It's a major operation that he started, yeah. But he loves it. But I also want to say thank you for joining us on this episode. If you enjoyed it, please give us a thumbs up. Subscribe down below and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye.